Hello everybody and welcome back to a brand new Doctor Who video where today I am taking a little look back at the original Sea Devil story ahead of Legend of the Sea Devils uh, this Easter. So yes guys once again sorry that there hasn't been many videos in a while a lot's been going on with university and just just I've genuinely been so busy plus there hasn't been loads to talk about in the world of Doctor Who recently so I felt like I kind of get away with it um, but I'm hoping to get back into more consistent uploads now certainly around Legend of the Sea Devils um, and obviously coming on Easter Sunday um, I'm hoping to have a few, few videos out around that including of course this one. So yes, given that we have the return of the Sea Devils um, in the Easter special, it felt no better time than ever to take a look back on their original story from 1972, uh, the 50th anniversary, of course, of the first appearance of the Sea Devils this year. Uh, and yeah, just take a little look back as a sort of review. I don't know if I'm going to recall it a review or not. I have no idea. But just a general chat and discussion about the story, what, you know, what I liked about it. I guess anything we can learn from it that could relate to Legends of the Sea Devils as well. But yeah, just a general look back over that as a story. So as I say, we travel back 50 years to 1972 season 9 of Doctor Who uh, featuring John Pertwee as the Doctor, um, Katie Manning playing Joe Grant, the companion, and the kind of regular recurring uh, villain of the Master, played by Roger Delgado as well. All, of course, though, this was his first appearance in Season 9, having been in every single story, all five stories of Season 8. He kind of gets arrested at the end of Season 8. And then we have a couple of stories um, in Season 9, Day of the Daleks and uh, The Curse of Peladon, where we don't see the Master at all. Uh, and then, of course, we start this story by establishing that the Master is now in prison. He's in a sort of maximum security prison, which is a nice bit of continuity continuing on from the end of season eight something that just doesn't happen that much in the classic series where you really have sort of story continuity between different stories carrying through so often these stories can become so individual that it feels like you've almost forgotten what happened last week so it's nice to see that kind of element of you know probably like nine months later or something compared to when people were last watching it in the end of the demons that the master is now imprisoned that that's carried on through but of course he's he is, he is in prison, but he's not really imprisoned. So yes, apart from a brief scene uh, sort of immediately after the titles where we see some sort of, you know, ship or rig or something that's been attacked by mysterious creatures making mysterious noises, I think we get to see a hand of one at one point, uh, but nothing else much. And then we pretty quickly cut to the Doctor and Joe um, arriving at, the, at the, the prison, which I guess initially seems fairly unconnected, but I guess it's inevitable. It's the master. It's obviously going to become, you know, something important and related to the whole Sea Devil storyline. And so I really enjoy in this sort of first episode of the of, of the six part story, of course, I, you know, I enjoy a lot of the interactions between the Doctor and the Master where, you know, as the audience, we're kind of we're, 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 we're pretty sure that something's up with the Master. You know, sure, he seems to be just, you know, settled in prison, um, seemingly, you know, fairly securely in prison. You know, he can't hypnotize the guards. He's, he's trapped there. That's it. But the Doctor's a little bit suspicious. And of course, we as an audience are very suspicious because we know what the master's like and then it of course fairly quickly transpires that you know he can just walk in and out of that prison whenever he likes and that actually he's the one running the show there because he wants to team up with the sea devils as we we later learn and there's a it, it does a fairly nice job of sort of building up the reveal of the sea devils i guess or a singular sea devil when they end up on the sort of the fort or the fortress whatever it's called when the doctor and joe go to visit that after having been at the naval base and um you, you kind of get a few shots of bits of a sea devil but i, I kind of feel like it would have worked better if the cliffhanger was a, a shot of the sea devil's face for the first time because it's obviously a fairly striking monster and i just feel like it could have been really effective to kind of gradually build it up and then use that cliffhanger rather than like two minutes before the cliffhanger to reveal their face and their whole sort of being but to, to do it on the cliffhanger moment i think that would have been really really effective but you know it still works overall fairly well but i did think it was notable watching it this time around i've watched this you know probably four five six times in the past um not for probably three years i think was the last time i watched this story but it was notable watching it this time around that actually how for the, the first half of this story really the first three episodes or so it kind of feels like a doctor versus the master story much more than anything to do with the sea devils despite that being the title you know we see very little of the sea devils through those first three episodes it's not really until uh, the end of episode three where we have the sea devil coming up out of the water albeit i must say i misremembered that scene where i thought at the end of episode three there was loads of sea devils that came out of the water there but it's actually just one that took that comes out of the water kind of scares the doctor and Joe a bit into going through a minefield then he gets you know blow, gets the blonde mines blown up near him and he runs back in the water and that's it it wasn't quite the big exciting moment that, that I, I remembered it to be but that's because of course it happens a bit later I think it's in episode five or episode six where we see you know 10 15 sea devils seemingly uh coming up out of the water to to, to sort of take over um which is you know it's a great moment when we get to see that but it's quite a lot later in the story so yeah I just felt it was pretty noticeable that it felt much more the doctor versus the master and sort of playing games with each other for those first three episodes 
episodes. Of course, you know, there's the brilliant fight scene at the end of episode two when the Doctor goes back into the prison and starts, you know, fight sword fighting with the Master. That's, you know, just great fun, I think. It's it's kind of quite dramatic. I think the music works really effectively in that scene as well. The stunts are really, really great. It's quite a prolonged scene. But I just really think it were it, it, it's such a just such a great action scene to watch. And then I thought it was a personally brilliant cliffhanger at the end of episode two, where obviously the, the sword fight's kind of finished. It seems like, you know, the doctor's kind of won that. And then he turns away to go and eat a sandwich or something, and then the master just throws this knife and then it cuts. Like, that's a really good cliffhanger. You know, obviously we know the master is not gonna stab Doctor in the back. Well, he will, but not literally with a knife. Um but it's still, you know, just this, the, the the action, the moment, the drama of that moment, I think, works so effectively to end that second episode on. We, of course, end up with a bit of escape capture type stuff with the Doctor getting locked up in prison and Joe having to come and save him and all that. You know, it, I don't want to call it padding, but it is kind of padding. Let's be realistic. Um, I feel like the saying with most six part Doctor Who stories is that you could kind of knock two to three episodes off them and they would probably be better. Um, you know, I, I don't feel like the Sea Devils is particularly slow, a classic Doctor Who story. Like, you know, I don't see sit there you know going through the episodes just waiting for something to happen because I feel like there's always enough going on to keep you interested particularly when they're utilizing so many vast and great looking locations I think you know the the, the, the fundamental setting of having it set sort of at sea and a naval base on on the coast I think that's a, sort of a scenery that we very rarely see in Doctor Who certainly in the classic series there's very few stories that are set properly either on water underwater you know in a naval base or anything like that that's just not often seen so I think that really adds to the scale and just the, the different feel to this story of course this story comes uh, in the midst of the unit era of Doctor Who where you know we, we, we get pretty used to by this point seeing soldiers with guns and the military and whatever like it's a pretty regular occurrence in virtually every story of the Pertwee era there's probably you know maybe a quarter of them that don't but fundamentally the brigadier mike yates sergeant benton you know they're all staples of most of the unit era but it's very notable in this story that of course none of them appear in any form and it feels like the sort of royal navy and captain hart kind of takes on the brigadier role and then the navy are sort of playing the unit soldiers essentially through this story um which you know is a really nice change i think and makes this story feel in many ways quite different to a lot of the other unit stories i know they are fundamentally playing the same function just in a sort of naval base and sort of sea and water based um, concept or story but I think it just really adds to the slightly different feel to this and and also helps to differentiate it from the Silurians which you know it's fair to say there's quite a few comparisons I know the Doctor references about four times in the story the fact that oh yeah these the, the, these creatures turned up before and actually you know I tried to make peace with them but I couldn't and then the Brigadier blew them up like it's it's very much I don't say treading the same ground but it's kind of not shying away from the fact that there are some similarities in the storyline, which I think is a better thing to do than pretend that you're not copying it when you kind of are doing something similar. Albeit, I do I do think that there are still some, you know, key differences in the plot here, really. Obviously, the Master is involved. It's much more of an alliance between the Master and the Sea Devils. The Master's fundamental motivation is just to kill all the humans to spite the Doctor. That is literally it. He just wants to make the Doctor feel pain and feel, you know, I don't know what, but that's basically all, the only reason he wants to help the Sea Devils to bring them up from their sort of hibernation and have them come and take over the Earth. That's that's basically his plan. The Sea Devils just want to supposedly reclaim the planet, which is exactly what the Silurians said in Doctor and the Silurians. Um, and so, yeah, there's kind of a similar parallel there, but then, you know, the Doctor's trying to convince them of peace until as always, the humans mess it up and go and start blowing stuff up. So they decide to side with the master and um, try and take over the Earth, which, you know, as I think, you know, if some of these monsters actually watched classic Doctor Who, they would have realised it never works trying to team up with the master because inevitably it goes wrong and the master bails out at the last minute. It happens so many times, particularly in the uh, sort of Pertwee and Roger Delgado of the master era. I feel like it's a fairly common occurrence. One thing the Sea Devils does kind of take away if we compare it to the Silurians is the sort of inner conflict between Silurians that we see we have in back in the Silurians we have this sort of older one who's you know I want to make peace this is what's more important to us and then the young ones who just I want war I want to kill people I want to take over blah 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 and you know we see that kind of conflict within the Silurian race in that story ultimately with the the, the young one killing the older one if they had names I cannot remember them um, whereas in this the sea devils there's actually only one sea devil who has a speaking part they don't say a line until episode five, I think it is. Certainly episode four might be episode five. Um, and it's only the singular, the sort of sea devil leader who seems to have a sort of 
uh, whereas all of them have a string vest sort of just top um, he has a string vest sort of cloak that you can see looks slightly different I don't think I'd noticed it before but this time I had noticed it and that's kind of how we differentiate the fact that he's the sea devil leader I guess um, but yeah he's the only one who has a speaking part and it's very much just his the sea devil's alliance with the master and there's no real inner conflict there between them which I guess makes it slightly less interesting in some ways really I mean a lot of it does as much as I love the sea devils I think they're great I think visually the costumes are stunning like even now and and it's it's shown by the fact that in legend of the sea devils the costumes look so similar to what we had 50 years ago that tells you how good a costume actually was even if it looks like a string vest like it still works really effectively but i feel like the sea devils as monsters do kind of become in this story kind of become a little bit of a sort of just a monster to shoot or be shot at um a bit of just a you know a faceless army of, of identical looking creatures because there's only one speak one leader who does any speaking um and you know that that's the only real kind of relationship i guess we can build up with the monsters in any way whereas the rest of it's just them following orders and either shooting people or getting killed but yeah certainly in the second half of this story it becomes much more of a sea devil story um because we finally kind of get that master and sea devil alliance it, it's a great moment when we have the doctor um get sucked down or it goes down in the sort of diving machine i don't even know what to call it diving vessel i guess maybe that's what you call it um and then you know disappears from it they bring it up cliffhanger oh no he's not there anymore um and then we meet in whatever the sort of sea devil base is down underneath the water which you know it, it all looked quite cool really i thought it was quite spacious quite you know it's quite weird looking um i quite like all that and then it's, it's you know it's nice to kind of get that sort of proper confrontation the doctors attempt to, to to you know make peace with the sea devils and then it ultimately going wrong of course as to be expected um and then yeah we get some really great stuff in uh, the end of episode five and episode six where the sea devils are essentially turning up and trying to take over the naval base we get so many great action scenes you know where they seemingly have taken over for a bit so that the master can come and you know do his work on the the whatever machine he needed to make to help uh, bring all the sea devils out of hibernation um, and there's just loads of great action scenes throughout episode six i think that's really what you know fun fundamentally the pert we in general really thrives on great action scenes and i think the sea devils is no different but it's really nice to have that slightly different setting of the yeah the sort of naval base and in the sea and, and all of that i just think it really really adds to the story and the the kind of feeling of it really the style of it it really just you know hammers home the style of story that we're in as you'd always expect that the doctor ultimately wins out of course but, but ultimately you know blowing up the sea devils he doesn't really do any you know a great good solution to it he just you know kills a load of sea devils and that's that's the way out and then the master escapes at the end of it as is inevitable in doctor who um and i'm sure that will be proved when the master inevitably turns up in the centenary special this year as well um that he somehow escaped gallifrey when it was about to be blown up because that's just what the master does um but yeah that's what he did at the end of the sea devils and that kind of wrapped up the the plot i guess of the story i mean fundamentally i really enjoy this story i think in my list like six seven years ago i think i did a top five pertwee story and put this number one I don't know if I'd still put it number one, but I certainly put it in like, you know, my top five Pertwee stories. I just think it's a it's it's a quite a different story in many ways because of the setting to what we're used to for the classic series. I think there's so many great Doctor and Master moments in this story, which is, you know, always a brilliant thing. And really with Pertwee and Delgado just always enhances the story. The Sea Devils, you know, visually are really, really fantastic as much as, you know, they don't have quite as much, I guess, character and personality as the Silurians. I still, you know, really enjoy their their role within the story. And I think working alongside the master, that works really effectively. Then on the backdrop of it being set on a naval base, being, you know, the underwater, the underwater element to it, you've got the really nice prison set as well. The, I think one of the things they do do really well in this story is the sort of transitioning between uh, locations and sets. So where you've got, you know, the, the location of the sort of castle that is the prison and then we'll kind of work our way to an interior shot as like Joe's breaking back in there or things like that. And it just really sells it for me. Like I really feel like I'm in this building and rather than in some stories where it can feel so, you know, just like the sets don't really match the actual exterior of the building and you don't feel like you're really a part of it. The same with the naval base as well. I just thought that all it just really sold it to me. It really sold that setting as, as being real, even though actually it was just obviously based in a studio. Now, I know one of the debatable things that many people have talked about over the years with this story is the music, because it's probably one of the most weird um, soundtracks you've ever heard uh, to a Doctor Who story. Like, yeah, sure, it uses a loads of funky synthesizers and just crazy weird sounds throughout it. 
but it really gives it a, a clear musical identity, which I think makes the story more memorable in many ways. And, you know, it's really that sound you associate with the Sea Devils and with this story. In some ways, I kind of hope that Signa Canola has listened to the Sea Devils score and brings out some of those really, really weird synthesizer sort of screeches, almost, I guess you describe it as, when the Sea Devils attack and they're sort of pulsating, you know, synthy beats as well that are in there. I just, I think there's so much interesting stuff within the score that, you know, as much as I love Dudley Simpson, I think he's brilliant. But hearing a sort of early radiophonic workshop, almost, I guess, type thing, you know, of what ultimately you know, the 80s Doctor Who became more like, it's sort of a much more rough around the edges version of what the scores to 80s Who became. Um, I think it's brilliant. I think it's a real change. And, you know, it's quite sort of groundbreaking, I think, in many ways. It's not perfect. Of course, it's not. There's a few moments where you're kind of like, does this music really fit the, 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 the feeling, the sense of this scene? I don't know. But in general, I think it really enhances and just makes it really vivid and memorable as a story. So yeah, overall, I thoroughly enjoy The Sea Devils. I mean, I certainly think it's better than Warriors of the Deep, which I'm going to come to um, in the next week or two before Legend of the Sea Devils. Um, I'm intrigued to see where Legend of the Sea Devils will take us as well. I don't think there's too much we can read into it. We obviously know that Legend of the Sea Devils is set in the 19th century, I think, or the 18th century, something like that, but, you know, a couple of hundred years ago. And the implication from this story is that all the Sea Devils were in hibernation at that time. So I don't know whether it's going to be supposedly the same set of Sea Devils, that just some of them got woken up earlier, maybe, or something like that, to, to you know, attack China in the, in the 1800s or something. Maybe. Um, or it'll be something completely different, but I don't think we can read too much into it here. But I'm definitely interested to see what their sort of Sea Devils plan is, I guess, in that story, because obviously here it seems their only real motivation is to reclaim the planet that is theirs, much as the Silurians was. Um, is that going to be, you know, the same sort of thing we see with in Legend of the Sea Devils, or have they got completely different motives? I'm, I'm very interested to see, you know, where that takes it as well. But yes, guys, that's just about it for this video. I'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, the Sea Devils, the story, the Sea Devils, um, in the comments below. You know, what are your memories of it? You know, did you when was the first time you watched it, and what did you think of it when you did you see it in 1972? I'd love if anybody's seen it in 1972, please um, comment down below. I think there was also a repeat of it, like a couple of years later because some cricket got cancelled or something um there was some version of it that was shown around christmas one year if you saw that as well let me know in the comments below i'm always interested to you know hear people who had the sort of as at the time experiences of watching these doc two stories and whether you know your views changed over all that time or whether you watched it last week for the first time as well, I'd love to hear all your thoughts on it down in the comments below. But that's just about it from this video, guys. As I say, I'll be doing a review of Warriors of the Deep coming up fairly soon before uh, the Legend of the Sea Devils airs. Of course, there's going to be preview videos for Legend of the Sea Devils to come. And, you know, you never know, maybe at some point we'll get some news about the 14th Doctor or RTD2 or something. And I can assure you there will be videos about it when we get to that. But that's it for now, guys. And please hit that like button, that subscribe if you're new here. Follow me on Twitter at EMS underscore productions. But until then, um, I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you again very soon for a brand new one. But until then, it's goodbye.